Ich helfe gerne auf diesen Chaos-Veranstaltungen. I really like to help on these chaos event and I really like to talk and one and someone said once upon a time, see, 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 they are the good guys. And this perception is created by P the two speakers that we are going to hear today because they work so hard on so many important things. Please give a warm round of applause for Constanze and Ingo on the topic of micro-targeting and manipulation. So, uh, thanks a lot for this rather pathetic beginning. Good morning. We're, we're happy to see that you're awake in such numbers. And um, we intend to talk about the Cambridge Analytica scandal, um, not, not at its core, but um, to take that as an inspiration to talk about political manipulation of public um, opinion. We want to look back at the year 2018 and... Um, talk about how this debate has been held for the first time, in my opinion, internationally as well. And we want to um, uh, talk about a few ideas coming from Brussels and Strasbourg as um, the upcoming EU elections are bringing in some pressure. And uh, we have some demands that we think would be um, useful to avoid uh, disasters as we've experienced in the past two years or at least so that we can recognize them as they're happening, if not prevent them. I mean, the scandal we've, we're talking about has happened a few years ago or is still ongoing since a few years, and we want to um, talk about how we can at least recognize this sort of um, backstabbing manipulation. And we'll start with a bit of a um, definition of terms, just to make sure we all... I have present what um, what this is about, and, and I mean the scandal has been a, a few months ago, and and so let's just make sure what are we talking about when we're talking about micro-targeting. Well, we um, we are talking about specifically talking to small and and smallest groups, so groups that are um, um, political or commercial groups that are. Um, very, very targeted and, and talk to very directly. So for microtargeting, you always need um, two things. It's not just tailoring th these messages and, and, and sending these messages, but it's always the analysis that goes before then that uh, defines these target groups and these targets. And that's always based on data profiles, uh, demographic factors, local factors, or geographic factors, um, uh, economic status, behavioral data, preferences, properties, and even psychometric analysis. And we'll talk about what that is in a bit. So this method um, is originally it's f with commercial marketing, but is widespread and uh, keeps spreading uh, in the political area. And let's just say um, it's not about um, looking at specific actors, but more about a structural review of these methods and the toolkit that exists to do so. And we are not um, going to talk about effect um, mainly. Empirical studies on how micro-targeting works are rare, and there are very different and controversial interpretations of this phenomenon. And we'll just leave it at, it's very context-specific as to how it works, and it really depends on which actors use it for, for, for what and in what scope. And if we want to keep things simple, um, we have, there, there is a bit of an analysis before these campaigns start, and um, in our Oh, and, and there's been a um, talk about police laws and, 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 and their um, c capabilities and so on. And um, as a party wants to support that or, or, or be against it, they, they do a analysis of voters and um, maybe uh, the anal analyst will say, well, as of this age of voter, um, this message will be particularly effective. 
And so they try to really tailor these messages to each other. And I believe that it's important to stress that it's really targeted, very, very specific. And we will talk about this into more detail about what Friederike talked about yesterday from uh, Privacy International. And it's also about people who actually do not have an account on these platforms. And, and that people actually are being analyzed across several devices that they own. And so let's say if you are just sitting on the tram and reading news on the way to work, then it will still be assigned and recognized as you. In the year 2018, year in the year 2018, the whole thing started, but the fake news problem was actually much, much older than that. And we would like to um, we like so we really want to talk about not talk about fake news, but we want to talk about the targeting aspect in this very talk. And m yeah, maybe some some people of you might remember if you still had Russian in school and and of course, before the digital era, people were trying to influence the general population with propaganda. And of course, with the technical possibilities today, we have a completely different approach that is still in principle the same as in the older days. And it's really important to remember that there is a lot of experience and old mythology that is creating the foundation and also creating the understanding on part of the people who try to manipulate and if you think about manipulations not only f during the Trump um, political campaigns but also during the Obama com uh, era um, people were always trying to influence other people and trying to influence the political public opinion and they were really interested in making everything functional, efficient, and um, effective. And, and, and so there is no final result yet. Um, some, some of you might have read the papers that investigated these issues and but we still don't know that much or we still don't have final conclusions. So there are some investigations going on, but there is no final conclusion yet for these investigations. And again, to the original setting, so if you, if you think about the European Union election next year, so how is the current political situation for once, it's we, we see that a grade of nervousness in the political public, and especially in the digital public, there's a lot of mistrust against it established parties, but also a general distrust against all news in the in on the internet, and this. The second aspect is that that the that um, that there are basically two big companies that are mostly responsible for digital publicity, and that's just Facebook and and ins Okay, um, so uh, these don't just produce um, um, content on, on, for, on their own side, but of course on the other side, and, and Google with YouTube and the DoubleClick Ad Network or analytics uh, services, they are extremely important and almost 
well dominant in terms of creating uh, a di digital public space. And uh, we can see both of these services providers are, are coming and they are an integral um, way of how digital public is, is, is structured and created. Um, and that's the, the inside tooling, which, which so that that provide people who, who have websites and run these campaigns know um, what they see. And, and there are toolkits for this sort of ad targeting where you can very easily um, put together, um, you know, what, what, what does my target group look like? Uh, where are they from? What they, what, how old are they? What properties do they have? And it's easy to, to, to do that. And um, a lot of people kind of know that, but it's sort of not very present in public debate is that it, both with Facebook and, and, and Google, there is a custom audience function which, which allows... Um, uh, which allows advertisers to contact people that they've been in, in, in touch before, whether you're a political or a commercial um, advertiser. If you already have um, contact data, emails, phone numbers, then I can upload those to the services or check with these people and, 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 and reach the people I want to reach. And moving on from there, there's the lookalike audience function where... I don't just get access to the people who I already have contact data of, but also people who um, are the same or very similar as far as their data profiles go as the people that I already have in my um, uh, database. And so all of these tools that are already provided by these platforms um, are an integral part of this ma micro-targeting without which none of this digital public would work. So, now that the um, GDPR has gone in force, um, that um, had, that had some consequences. You know, if I have a mailing list already. Um, am I even still allowed to upload that to these services? And there was some discussion about that. Um, and uh, so in Great Britain, all of the political parties have been requested not to do that. And that will be um, done in the courts. And in Germany, we have this um, discussion as well. And um, the uh, Bayre, uh, the, the Bavarian um, Data Protection Agency has the same view and will try to enforce that as much as they can. Um, well, in the Cambridge Analytica scandal, um, they, they it was interesting, the data that was... Oh, the questions that came up in, uh, in the investigations for the Cambridge Analytica scandal were mostly interesting because these companies finally had to answer some questions. And um, so what was interesting there was that you could see what was liked, what ads did people click on, what apps do people use. And um, if you have people who use these services and um, then you can get data that cannot be used due to this discrimination prohibition. And, well, this stupid Facebook, well, there are two types of scandals and we probably forgot what the essence of this scandal is and why it was so big um, on an international level. And and then also the parliaments who basically said, okay, we're going to get back to you on these issues. So even before the scandal, there were reports on scandals with Cambridge Analytica, but not in that magnitude. And this scandal is a special one because, first of all, it's about Facebook and 
They are known for being not very strict about privacy and secondly, um, because um, because data have been used without user knowledge and without user consent for this targeting in political campaigns. And so let's quickly summarize for what was actually the issue with Cambridge Analytica. So there was, or how was it founded? Um, there was a scientist that basically created then Cambridge Analytica and and there are actually some interesting name, uh, interesting stories how the name Cambridge Analytica came to be. Maybe, maybe it's because so okay. Um, Note by the um, translator, I couldn't understand that unfortunately, and so. So what they used was a, an app that was originally thought meant to be used for scientific analysis, and they used that. Uh, um, they 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 hired um, these click workers working for s sense. Um, um, they took that app, which is connected to Facebook, and 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 filled out. Um, uh, this questionnaire according to the ocean model, which is a an established psychological model, so that um, these people could be sort of um, their personalities could be determined by these five characteristics. So, um, uh, as they filled that out, they 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 um, provided them with a very rich data set um, uh, from Facebook, including all of their friends and and that came up to i think 80,000 if i heard that correctly um people and um so they took these personality analysis of the 23,000 who filled out the questionnaires and um searched for similarities amongst the data profiles at, on facebook so that they ended up with um psychological personality uh, problems of 87 of thousands or even millions if I heard that correctly um, uh, people had and so in the US they had a lot of more um, relaxed access to um, voter data and so they used all of that data to try and um, support the Trump campaign in their political uh, communication. So, as Christopher Riley, the whistleblower, describes, they use that to create these fitting um, ecosystems of information, including blogs and other websites, so that they could target people. And they, they created this impression of a neutral public, a neutral uh, reporting by creating these websites and blogs um, that they could then show to people um, on topics from uh, gun laws to immig immigration. Um, and of course, that was mostly on political issues that were very polarizing and divisive. And of course, they used it for micro-targeting in door-to-door in -door campaigning, which is a very important, important thing in the US. And they, they created up to 33 um, uh, conversation guidelines and they knew like if I ring a uh, the doorbell on this door which um, guidelines should I use and um, they used it even on um, Hillary voters because they knew that certain voter groups would not be reachable for that but they used it to strategically demobilize the opponents so in in regions where um, Hillary is strong or, or would be historically particularly strong women people of color they specifically sent them negative information to discredit um, that candidate uh, so women got a lot of um, advertising um, 
which talked about the um, affair of uh, Bill Clinton uh, to um, undermine the image of, of Hillary Clinton as this brave feminist that the Democratic Party was painting. Um, and, and that's sort of a lot more widespread um, in, in, than in, in European or German um, uh, political advertising. Um, so uh, there was a lot more possibility for manipulation there because this character um, advertising is, is much more important. There's no definitive analysis um, how much this affected the result. Um, uh, it's, it's clear that, that this manipulation happened and, and that it would have some effect, but we can't say definitively if there wouldn't have been a President Donald Trump without this. Um, oh, we do know that um, if we know about the distribution of the voters, we can um, do our political advertising much more effectively. Um, and again, we can use these demotivating uh, messages. And of course, that played a much bigger role than it did in uh, the Obama uh, campaign, which did a lot of that too, but was much less criticized for it. And of course, um, it boils down to 27,000 votes in three different uh, states. So it was a really, really tight race at the end. So we also want to talk about the Brexit referendum because that was also terribly, terribly close. And because in the British Parliament, the debates, uh, the, the investigations are a lot more public and a lot more precise. And the statements that that happened afterwards in in British Parliament um, they even they, they, they brought entire catalogs of question for the uh, corporations and Cambridge Analytica and and um, what is exactly about what is exactly happening and being done and we can always just talk about the advertising companies and, and data companies but we also have to um, look at uh, the political parties who, who regulate this and, and how much are they interested in that themselves the, how big is the conflict of interest there um, since I mean we are clearly talking about questions of power and uh, after like, like in in the US con in, in US um, um, it, it, every four years somebody is elected and and Trump could be um, um, president for eight years but brexit that will be a problem for generations and it will be much more um, uh, a much more important question and and much longer lasting and it was even more close so um, we can see with the Brexit um, referendum that the pro-Brexit side, Leave, um, exchanged a, a lot of um, data internally um, between the different um, uh, groups there, which is not exactly appropriate following the rules on, on uh, data sharing. Um, so... It, just because I provide my data to one campaign, I did not consent to them sharing um, this data with other campaigns and other corporations um, that are formally independent and not supposed to work together. And uh, we also saw that um, the leadership of one of these um, uh of an insurance company was um, uh, very close to one of the pro-leave campaign and so the customer data of that insurance company was used to target people for pro pro brexit um, campaigns and uh, it's also important to to note that um, leave also used a lot of um, question uh, a lot of messages of questionable veracity and outright lies and, and the investigations on that are still not done. Okay, as we're running out of time, um, we are keeping the next few topics short. 
um, but we want to mention in, them. In Ireland, there was a referendum about abortion, because, uh, about the law about abortion, which was very strict, and it was a very polarized debate in the, popul in the um, public. And among other things, we could notice that in this political debate, there was not only people in Ireland influencing um, the debate, but also um, religious fundamentalists from the United States also tried to influence the outcome of these um, debates. And they actually set up websites on in the United States to influence um, the general public's opinion about this debate. And so to highlight, this was just about very low sums and, and people were actually spending a good amount of money on funding campaigns, even if it didn't ex affect their own country. And, and of course, this is something you don't notice until the whole campaign and the whole debate is over. Another example is the election in Kenya in 2017. There were two parties. And what we could see is that in Kenya and in many other African countries is that privacy laws are a lot um, weaker and all the parties have a huge amount of data about people, including biometric data, telephone numbers. And we also saw a lot of negative campaigning against yeah um, th with the campaigns of the former and re-elected president by using um, by using negative campaigning and what we've seen is that a development that um, somewhat foreshadows what we will see in Europe as well, that there's a lot of things going on with messengers. So, for instance, WhatsApp groups or other messengers that people were really targeting people on these messaging challenge uh, channels and this was easy because the parties knew the telephone numbers of those people. That's why they could target them. And we already know that 2019, there will be a lot of elections. And it's, it's very important to, and important and interesting to look at the new communication channels. But, but but what we should actually, but what we what we should also do is like follow the money, see who spends money where, on which, what, and and we will probably see many new technical strategies to influence people. And of course, if you consider Facebook, different continents have a different usage of Facebook. And yeah, for instance, in France, you had a great debate about um, um, uh, okay, so we're switching to Austria now, um, the election in 2017. And I hope you will see a pattern. In Austria, in the election in Austria, we had seen that 
an advisor and election manager of a social party was, was very well versed with these methods. He used faked Facebook pages. F so he created a website it's on Facebook called We for Sebastian Kurz and and they looked legit and they looked like it's all real but this was meant to um, okay Constantis noticing notifying me of the time that's running out um, so it was really like misinforming uh, people. It, it had a lot of followers, and and it was also used to gain data, user data, to know who could be targeted, with based on the people who left data on that um, Facebook website. Uh, of course, y y as you can imagine, that was that led to some fierce debates here, and obviously, it's still not clear if these attempted campaigns really affected the results. But it's, I mean, we have to see that that in Austria, um, the, this uh, micro-targeting and negative campaigning has been uh, a lot more. Uh, strong. Um, uh, even if we uh, look at other examples than the, the this most crazy example of Tal Silverstein, um, in Germany, um, there was a lot of nervousness, there was a lot of fear, especially after the the Bundestag hack, um, and 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 that these that that there would be leaks and 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 from the Bundestag hacks. So there was a lot of nervousness and insecurity um, ahead of the election. And and the party is a part of a rather very vague um, self-declaration. Didn't really do anything to to get rid of this fear and insecurity, at least not by by um, tra providing transparency. Us at Netzpolitik.org, um, we, we tried to create some... Um, transparency there, like how much money is being spent and so on, but we basically we ran into a wall there. We straight up asked them, and, and, and they're not just the ones who regulate these things, um, so we just went and asked them, show us, um, who are you paying, how much, what for? You are, you are creating these disinformation campaigns. What's the point? And the responses were pretty much zero. Green Party um, uh, were the most open. Um, Die Linken, the leftist party, um, talked about it fairly openly. But all the others, FDP, AfD, CDU, um, they did not answer. They did very little to create uh, transparency and information. So, since we don't want to talk about the specific actors or examples, we, but rather about methods. Um, let's summarize. What are the methods we have to watch out for? What, what do we have to expect uh, in 2019? So, we tried just writing this, uh, this again. So, seduction. Um, messages um, tailored to individual personality profiles. We don't want to... We, 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 we don't want to say that, like... Um, that this is the responsibility of the individual voter or anything, um, but we all need to be aware of these methods of, of attempted manipulation. O of course, it, it can't be everyone's individual responsibility. We need to have a political response and, and, and um, information. Um, this list may help. We're not going to go through all of them one by one. Let's talk about the measures that have already been taken in the EU. Um, so, since December, very new, there is this um, uh, this, this um, catalogue of, of measures that 
shall be taken. Um, that comes from the EU Commission. So th that's the first time they actually did something at all, and that was all they did. Um, EU regulation is not does not happen fast. Um, they put down some proposals and requested the other all of the member countries to um, implement them, and and that's more than just disinformation. But um, well, it, it's kind of a big thing. Um, Okay, so they, they don't just want to um, try to cr stop disinformation, but they want to provide and pay for counter-propaganda. And the British um, uh, company, um, uh, British government uh, ran into um, uh, trouble here, and, and, and the, they, they had problems because... Um, uh, a group that they paid that was supposed to work against Russian um, propaganda suddenly was targeting the leader of the opposition, Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and now we are building the same structures for counter-propaganda and that, um, that didn't work in a couple of countries and in, 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 in Great Britain that actually had quite some problems and, 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 and um, it's going to have consequences in other countries as well because they... Um, targeted um, Spain um, because their um, the, the head of their secret service wasn't um, they weren't happy with that with that person so they targeted Spain and so that's going to have some consequences and and um, it's it, that's not a good situation but a lot of parties are not going to care because they want to use these methods themselves so um but we have to say also that the EU uh, doesn't really have the competences in this area. It can't do a lot. Um, it's a bit late, but they are trying to work on some monitoring of these methods and this disinformation. Um, they, they, they had to recognize early 2018 that um, the election commissions in the various countries just didn't know. Uh, s s some of them just didn't answer the questions that the EU asked them. Um, so not just that they weren't ready, didn't have any measures in place or, or prepared, they just didn't react even. So the EU Parliament um, uh, passed some demands, but they are not binding. Um, so we'll pass over those and go on to our, our um, demands. So... The first one, since we had this polarizing debate about the GDPR, um, we believe that our first demand, which is data protection, is manipulation protection. Um, because as individual countries in Europe um, start to recognize that um, uh, political manipulation is done with these, um, with this data that is being gathered, um, then it becomes very pressing that um, data protection laws um, are in place here, if only so we can see if people are trying to do this manipulation. And at the same time, data protection is manipulation protection. Um, and and that, um, that, even ap that applies especially also to shadow profiles. So even if you aren't using it, data was gathered about you. And so that becomes ever more paramount. We, we do have some uh, specific questions here. Um, well, we're going to try to go through this in the last two minutes. We've got our sign signal now. Um, political campaigning. Yeah. Political campaigning is always about convincing people. Um, but what we can see is that these digital platforms with their tools uh, make it possible to have this really, really strong asymmetry between those who do political communication and campaigning and those who are being manipulated. So it's absolutely necessary to create transparency there so that political advertising is is um, labeled and that you can always see, at least with the possibility to see 
who is targeting me, who is paying for this ad. And uh, of course, that's n not just a transparency register, um, but a, a collection of information on which providers um, actually provide this ability, uh, who are they, and who uses them with what money. Um, the British actually gathered this information, and you can look at the data from 2018 to 2018, you can see where that money is going and where it's being moved around. And you can see, uh, you know, is cross-devicing being used, and, and, and which corporation gets the money. Um, 3.2 million pounds were used for that, and, and um, which isn't the very little money, and, and we just don't have that data in Germany, for example. We should change that, but that would mean that in we have to change the party law in, in, in Germany. As in there, that's where the uh, main rules are for transparency um, for political parties. And those are okay, but they aren't um, about where that money goes. And to create this sort of equality, these equality of, of possibilities for candidates, um, um, we have that for TV, but we don't have that for these advertising com com companies. So uh, we do not have this equality of opportunity for political candidates for these advertising companies. That's one. But of course, we as voters have to um, take these political parties to task. It, it, we have to know... Um, what they are using the money for, wh with which criteria are they targeting people. And it, it's not okay that we have to go after that information and, and keep asking and begging them for that information. They have to proactively um, tell us that. Um, uh, psychrometric profiling is, is already tricky. Um, and really... I'm that's targeting I, I wouldn't be sad if that if it were uh, forbidden to target particularly vulnerable um, segments of society with these methods um, um, so Facebook and Google create this um, um, the, 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 uh, a manipulation force that is so big that we cannot deal with this with, with, with smaller measures. The smaller measures are nice and all, but we really have to take big steps to deal with these tools that they just hand out, uh, which have such a great potential, and we have to regulate that and, and deal with that. Uh, sorry, it's our last sentence. Really, we're... we're We'll we'll write about this again and 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 talk about even all the things we we we, we skipped. Okay, and Cetrum uh, Google at Facebook.